All right, thank you, <clears throat> and uh, and welcome for joining. So we're going to talk uh, about a few things here, try and put them, somehow make them all work together. Uh, I ask, we're going to start talking a little bit about marketing communications. We're going to start talking about a little bit about um, text, uh, mostly uh, text and, and call sort of marketing through auto dialers and, and other means through uh, traditional sort of um, commercial marketing means, uh, and then sort of segue that a little into you know, how it connects with privacy issues and then end uh, just with a uh, sort of a little reminder on cybersecurity uh, given sort of the industry at the moment. So the first thing we're going to talk about, as I said, we'll talk a little bit about certain federal key privacy laws relating to marketing campaigns. Uh, the first one is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, the TCPA, which was enacted in 1991, and is pretty much the um, the main federal regulation relating to telecommunications and e-commerce. Um, one of the reasons why uh, communications are used or, or, or text communications are particularly uh, well used these days is because uh, surveys have shown not, about 98% of text communications are opened by recipients. And depending on the nature of the, the, the email communication, it could be as few as 3% for, communi for, uh, for communications for uh, commercial messages. So obviously there is a, a desire to send out email or send, sorry, send out text messages. But as a result of that, given the volume of text messaging, there's also the potential for significant liability uh, in that space. So since the um, F so since the um, uh, TCP came out in 1991. The FCC uh, has been the primary sort of rulemaking body in terms of right, you know, creating regulations uh, to interpret the TCPA. Um, and there has been a number of uh, regulations uh, or a number of um, 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 uh, interpretations over the years. We're not we're not going to go through the whole history of those, but understand that generally the uh, TCPA will cover the use of automated phone. Uh, telecommunications uh, will cover the um, the use of an artificial and pre-recorded voice recordings, uh, addresses the type of lines. There are differences between what's called a residential landline, uh, a wireless, and a uh, fax uh, number. And, and, as, and as every time I think that we're you know um, fax machines are are out the door, I re you know, um, I still don't know why I have one, but I have, you know, it's connected to a multi-device and I uh, received one, you know, you said, you know, a, a spam fax this morning, but still, you know, there are still record uh, settlements with respect to uh, junk faxes that occur these days. And they're still used for marketing quite a bit as well. Uh, but that being said, so the, the, the uh, TCBA will cover um, any type of uh, communication sent to a wireless device and that's both residential and business cell phones and wireless devices, including uh, sending of text messages vo using VoIP uh, and using uh, other non-traditional communications where there's no charge and call. Uh, landline phones, but landline phones are only, it's only residential landline phones. And then fax machines are both residential and commercial fax machines as well. And essentially it, it covers a spam uh, message, which is any essentially any message, which is unsolicited advertisement, which covers all sorts of, um, you know, uh, the solicitation of goods or services or products. So the TCPA places restrictions on the uh, um, on calls that would violate a consumer's request to receive calls. So that's your do not re, uh, do not request uh, number that you can have now and do not request lines. There's both the national uh, do not call registry, and then each company is required to maintain their own internal do not call uh, number. And again, this is for not only foot, but this is phone calls and text messages. Um, they're required, you know, the restrictions on, as I mentioned, uh, landline phones, um, informational and telemarketing calls and text messages to wireless devices um, as well. And then the there's a further uh, further restrictions on the type of equipment that can be used uh, to contact individuals, and that would be, you know, through the automated uh, telephone dialing service. And so the uh, there's also the ability. We'll talk about in a moment of the uh, of um, of internet to text as well. So it's not just dialing or, or utilizing a device to uh, text from one one device to the other. The um, PCPA protects consumers from receiving phone calls um, after being requested not to be called. So that again is. 
uh, companies are required to check both the national do not call registry as well as anytime an individual responds to a company and tells them not to call them, they're supposed to check those two numbers. And then within 31 days um, of that, uh, a number, um, uh, you're, you're unable to, to call that number. And so businesses have, you know, so once you register your number as on the do not call registry of business has 31 days to update its own registry uh, not to call those individuals. So the, there are, because the differences between residential and landline communications, there are, there are some differences between or sorry, between landline and wireless, uh, there are some differences that organizations have to be aware of. So generally speaking, um, the calls made, calls or texts made to either residential or wireless devices can only be made between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. on the recipient's local time zone. Uh, this notably becomes, uh, is an interesting source of litigation because uh, you know, uh, traditionally companies utilize, you know, may have a database knowing where the individual is, but a lot of times based upon the area code on the phone number, realizing especially wireless numbers, if not all numbers are portable and people may pick up a phone in on the West Coast, move to the East Coast or vice versa. And so their, their time zones are off. Uh, and that still uh, organizations have been, uh, been held liable because it's based upon the recipient's time zone. Um, there's also, you know, I said prohibitions on numbers made on the do not call list, also on the using artificial or pre-recorded voice recordings without the prior express written consent of the individual. Um, if you're talking just a residential landline, um, you can make informational calls using an artificial pre-recorded voice call. You can use an automated, um, an automated dialer and you can make manual calls. Um, so the, uh, and, and I should say, as I see some questions coming in, so we will, um, hopefully, I think these questions will be answered. I have a couple of examples also in the presentation, but if not, I will get to all of the questions um, at the end of this presentation or at the end of the day today. So we want to um, understand, so the, the other thing is under, under the rule, the, uh, uh, a caller cannot make more than three calls within a consecutive 30-day period using any type of artificial pre-recorded uh, pre voice recordings to residential numbers. Um, and so for any, you know, and so um, the, there are exemptions, but n none of those exemptions will apply here, such as, you know, if you're a non-for-profit or if it's not commercial purposes as well. Um, so wireless, so the, 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 the limitations for both wireless calls and texts under the, uh, under the TCPA. Uh, and, and so essentially these were a little bit more restrictive because traditionally you paid for every incoming call or text on a wireless device. Pretty much that's non-existent today, but the rules still uh, apply. Same sort of the, the rules, as I mentioned, um, no, you know, no calls or texts before 8 a.m. or 9 p.m. or after 9 p.m. Um, you have, you know, there's a prohibition. You need to check your do not call registry. You need to check the company's internal do not call registry. Um, no telemarketing calls using artificial pre-recorded text. Um, you, you, know, you may not use a ATD, ATDS or an automated di uh, dialer uh, for telemarketing without the prior express written consent. Um, you informational calls um, can be used uh, using artificial pre-recorded calls. Um, after, without receiving ex prior express written consent, meaning it does not need to be a written consent uh, for that. Um, and then informational calls um, and texts using the automated dialers uh, without, um, maybe made without receiving express written consent as well. And then if you're making a manual call, meaning you were actually physically calling or texting, you, you know, a, human, a person is actually dialing uh, the number, you do not require uh, the consumer consent except if the number is on the national do not registry or the do not call list or the internal call. Um, the, let go on. So essentially in terms of enforcement um, on the uh, TCPA, it's enforced by the FCC, uh, state attorney generals and other, you know, uh, governmental agencies will bring enforcement actions, individuals will bring class action uh, litigation. These are fairly, um, profitable. So recently, uh, just uh, without naming uh, anyone on, on the call, just in case or naming any of the cases, um, not too not too long ago in the hospitality space, there was um, uh, one defendant who ended up uh, settling for seventy five million dollars 
another one who ended up settling for $50 million and another 15, I believe it was in uh, legal fees on top of that. So these number, you know, so there are fairly large, uh, significant numbers in, in, in uh, doing so. Um, in particular, as the, um, if you think about it on a class action basis, the number of calls that are made, you can get uh, a claim for $500 in statutory damages and as much as $1,500 uh, for each willful violation of this. And so, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those claims in just a moment. Um, so, well, actually, I just started. Sorry, I moved on to this slide just a little bit ahead. Uh, but essentially, the you know the um, um, the 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 issue here is that uh, there's been a number of cases that have dealt with whether or not there has been consent or prior consent uh, by the individual. Uh, what was consent? Whether it was written consent or not? Um, and then there was, and then you know, in, in the case here, we're talking about um, last year in Facebook versus. Uh, do, do good um, that whether or not you know what an automated dialer was and so the in 2015 essentially the FCC had claimed that not only was an auto dialer any device that had the capability of making calls uh, to uh, two devices um, um, or making call you know it was also the uh, technology or uh, equipment that had the capability, the future capability. And so what ended up happening was in theory, pretty much every smartphone got engulfed in that in terms of being potentially an, a, uh, an ATDS um, equipment. So in this particular case, it actually narrowed a little bit about what a, um, you know, what a, you know, what an ATDS uh, is. And so we restricted them to equipment that had with the capacity to store a telephone number using a random or sequential number generator or to produce a telephone number using a random or sequential number tel uh, generator. Uh, essentially, uh, the court said that that had essentially followed the plain uh, reading of the, the language of the statute. Um, so since then, what we're seeing in this last year, since this case came out, uh, a lot of the new cases seem to focus on uh, communications that are triggering the provisions of the statute, which are unaffected uh, by this case. And those are receiving cases now on pre-recorded messages and artificial voice calls, uh, ringless voicemail, and that's become a, a fairly um, um, new one was that you, you check, you, you know, you'll see in your voicemail, all of a sudden you'll have a message or two, but your phone never actually rang. And then phone numbers and the easy, you know, and one that's still, you know, that, that's uh, still going fairly strong and has just increased in the volume of cases are calls to, you know, people on the national do not call registry as well as company white internal do not call issues. Um, the, um, a number of cases, uh, uh, a number of cases that we saw um, in the past are cases about, you know, failure to, to honor this stop message. Um, but now we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a new sort of version of that now, but um, that's the, um, uh, where, where we're seeing focusing on right now on the, on the cases with TCPA really as I said, those things uh, dealing with the do not call registries, the artificial and pre-recorded voices and ringless voicemail, which has become fairly new. So there's also um, companies have sort of some new tools as well uh, to, to utilize. There's this new, which um, back in just a few months ago in November of 2021, the reassigned numbers database. Uh, the, there was a problem that if so, if individuals had given up their phone number or somebody else had taken it, um, you may become liable for uh, for making phone call or making calls to those individuals because you may have received consent from somebody, uh, you know, under the prior number. They give the number up, the number is given up, and then all of a sudden you send a text message to somebody, or you send a pre-recorded voice call to somebody who who did not consent to that. And you could be held responsible. So there's this new reassigned numbers database. Um, which includes all the carriers belonging to it, enables businesses and their vendors to lit, to query the database to determine if a number has been deactivated or reassigned, and then allows them to uh, update their own internal call list. Um, there's also, if a company sort of complies with this obligation, or uh, there's also a safe harbor. So if a company does make a phone call to a reassigned text um, or sends a text uh, to a reassigned number, then assuming they follow the protocols, there is that safe harbor. Otherwise, um, inadvertently making a call to a reassigned number or text that has not consented could uh, could result in significant liability. Um, one thing that we're seeing that's you know that that's being watched out for is there's been a lot of discussion and and, and just very recently um, as of and you'll understand why in a moment um, people have been sort of wondering whether a text message is a call. 
Uh, and this has become sort of a very big uh, 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 sort of loud concern of the last couple of days, especially. And that's because the original language of TCPA does not include any message or any content or any discussion about uh, or even mention the word text. Um, when the FCC had the ability to update TCPA years ago, uh, it did not include a re any reference uh, to a text message or to text. Uh, traditionally, um, TCPA has been uh, has been shown or has been decided or determined that would include text. But uh, Justice Thomas, um, during the oral argument, had, had asked the question essentially as to why is a text message considered a call under the TCPA. Uh, that has been, you know, people have been wondering about that ever since. Uh, but given uh, sort of recent events, uh, there's been a big wonders that if, if uh, there's going to be a change or if there's going to be some cases to challenge whether or not a text message is actually covered by the TCPA. Um, I want to just, well, uh, <clears throat> also pause for a moment as, or, or note that in addition to TCPA, just sort of essentially is sort of with it while there's the Cellular Tele Telecommunications Industry Association, and while it does not have any um, ability to to bring up, you know, to sue a company, um, this is a organization uh, association made up of the wireless companies that, if they get viol if they hear violations essentially of communicating uh, to individuals, that they may suspend the mobile, you know, your, or, or terminate one's access for the ability to send text messages uh, to their to their customers. So it's worth just noting they have their own rules about, you know, their um, campaigns and, 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 uh, and, and requirements. And I'll show you a few of those in just a moment. Um, they also provide sort of the short code system. You'll see that there's like the five, five digits or so that people are allowed to opt into. Uh, so you can advertise, you know, um, text, you know, um, you'll see some examples vacay to, you know, one, two, three, four, five as an example. So a couple of best practices, you know, complying with TCPA. Um, some of this deals with, you know, in terms of having your safe harbor, some of it deals with, um, you know, the rules that are out there. Uh, most of these we've already sort of discussed, um, but you need to have, you know, at any time you're sending a message um, or you have on your policies, you should have the, you know, a clear mechanism for opt out. And I'll show you some examples of all these in a moment. Um, you should have, you know, uh, to take advantage of safe harbor rules, um, establish a process for checking your numbers against the DNC registry because companies are obligated that once a phone number appears on the DNC registry, you have 31 days to update your files, uh, to, and that's your sort of safe harbor window. Uh, you need to pro obviously you want to process all of your opt out requests. Uh, clearly, you want to uh, make sure you obtain your consents. Um, and provide those disclosures. You want to keep any informational messages, you know, free from advertising. That's to avoid getting caught up in TCPA. Um, records of consent should be kept for four years. Um, and you want to validate, you know, uh, another best practice is anytime you have a number uh, before sending the commercial message, you may want to send a message to sort of um, double to confirm the marketing. I'll show you some of that in a moment. Um, and so other rules are you need to, you know, any type it is, anytime there is a commercial message, you need to clearly identify who is sending the campaign and what and what is being messaged or sent in the campaign. And then also sort of keep up with state laws. And I'll show you why in just a moment. Uh, so Florida, where I know a lot of you are located, um, this is a, you know, there, there's been, um, whereas most states have sort of eased up a little bit or at least following um, um, the TCPA Florida in the Florida Telephone Solicitation Act has actually kind of made it a little bit more um, encompassing and, and so it has raised the stakes there. So in Florida, it expanded the automated dialer to include any automated system for the selection or dialing of a telephone number or playing a recorded message. Uh, and so this in incorporates a larger number of devices as well. Uh, it has additional requirements, including the prior express written consent for all telephonic sales using an automated system. So this, you know, this has, uh, you know, uh, um, in, in enhances or creates an escalated or an elevated level of consent required. Um, it also removes, importantly, uh, certain exemptions. Uh, one was that so calls that were initiated in response to somebody um, who, who may have called the automated call or a live message was, you know, or a live message was detected. And also um, calls, you know, concerning previously ordered goods or services. So if somebody, you know, again, if somebody was a customer and you want to call uh, regarding these services um, that were previously ordered, you need to um, obtain that consent as well. Um, same, same sort of thing, private right of action, $500 per violation, up to $1,500 for violating. Um, and then I've got apparently 
Texas appear on this slide, but it should be on the next slide. But essentially in Texas, I, I apologize, some of the some of the states got mixed up here at the end, but uh, Texas does have a rule that, so prior, if you wanted to make a telephone solicitation, you need to register um, with the Texas Secretary of State. Um, if you register uh, your solicitation before, um, um, uh, sorry, if you if you make if you solicit if you make a solicitation prior prior before registering, sorry, you can have a penalty of up to five thousand dollars for each call that is made. So Texas can be a fairly significant one as well if you don't re pre register uh, as well uh, as well. And there's a few other uh, mini uh, state mini TCPA laws. So I got a couple of these. Oklahoma has one uh, which was effective last year. It includes a private right of action of five hundred dollars per violation. As you see, uh, Georgia has one it's expected to pass in 2023, has a private right of action of at least $1,000 per violation, um, as well as includes, interesting enough, a, the draft has a um, provision for a class action for which the damages limitation in the paragraph will not apply. So essentially that you could have a class action with uncapped damages. Um, there's the Washington, there's um, House Bill, which is effective last year, uh, and that sort of falls onto this slide that uh, a telephone solicitor you have to end a call within 10 seconds if you indicate that the other party does not uh, that they want to end the call and you can't same sort of thing you can't uh, uh, place or receive a call uh, what's interesting is the end call is at 8 p.m not 9 p.m so it ends at a little bit you know an hour earlier uh, washington has another bill in place and for expected in 2023 which would have would increase the private right of action to a thousand dollars for anyone using an automated dialing and announcing device. Um, and then, um, you know, and so these are additional remedies available uh, in addition to the existing uh, consumer protection laws. Uh, and Virginia has one as well. Um, you must, a telephone solicitor must identify themselves first with their, with their first and last name. And they must then identify the, you know, who they're calling on behalf of. And a failure to start a call um, with, without stating who, you're, who you are would be a $500 violation for the first thousand dollars for the second violation and five thousand for each additional subsequent violation um it's also worth noting the ftc has some telemarketing sales rules that sort of um, um are a little bit more consumer focused but they sort of they, they usually follow along with the tcpa and you see a lot of these follow up in some of the tcpa issues as well and notably it doesn't distinguish between landline and residential and mobile numbers um, it has the same rules with the TCPA about pre-recorded calls to landlines, doing a call, you know, et cetera, but it does not have a private right of action. Um, but the right, but you do see this with uh, agencies and uh, provide, uh, bringing these claims. So we're going to switch over, oh, act, uh, switch over to uh, can spam. I'll talk about a little bit about that for a moment. Uh, this is obviously more, more directed to uh, email communications. Emails, of course. Um, you know, the, the reason why this was uh, created was essentially that, you know, there's an ease and efficiency with, with email, but it also brings drawbacks given the, the large volumes of emails that people receive a day. Um, especially a number of them could be fraudulent, misleading, um, or contain um, offense or con offensive content. So in 2003, Congress enacted the Controlling the Assault of Non-Solicited Pornography and Marketing Act, or CAN SPAM, as you see here. Um, and notably, it does not it does not prohibit all unsolicited commercial email, but it does prevent it does put limitations on the types of emails that can be uh, that can be sent. Um, it does regulate though, while it doesn't prohibit it all, it does regulate all types of commercial email messages, uh, not just the unsolicited ones. So a commercial message is, you know, any message where it has the primary purpose. Um, of the message to deliver a commercial advertisement promotion of a commercial product or service, essentially. The, um, <clears throat> the first thing that, that one has to think, consider is that whether or not the, um, the email itself is deemed a commercial message or not. Um, so again, the, the way can spam works is that, you know, transactional emails um, will not, will, are, are not covered. So if a trans over so if a primary purpose is, of, is to sort of relate to a particular transaction or relationship between the consumer and the business, uh, those are not covered. So for example, completing or facilitate some type of commercial transaction, something previously agreed to by the recipient, um, providing you know, warranty information, product information, safety information, et cetera, uh, things related to employment relationship or, or benefit plans, 
uh, regarding the delivery of goods or services. So, you know, your, your delivery, your, your status updates on deliveries and as well as if there's you know a type of established relationship between the parties however if the primary purpose uh, you know if you include both commercial and transactional content in the email then you sort of have this balancing test on which one you know is the primary purpose of the email commercial or transactional um, and so obviously if the primary if the email itself is just a commercial or advertising one content um, obviously that would be a commercial purpose um, and then the question would be, you know, for those that are mixed, and there's a lot of litigation on the um, on these mixed relationships. The question is, would a recipient interpret the subject line to mean that the message contained commercial advertisement, or is a substantial part of the transactional relationship content? Does it appear, you know, where does it appear? And if, and if the substantial content at the beginning of the message is transactional, most likely be transactional. So this would be, for example, uh, there was a lot of interesting litigation related to transactional emails and at the bottom of them, it would advertise things like conference coming up, an event coming up, but it would be like in the footer um, of those emails or, or be something at the very bottom, just advertising something or that you may be interested in. You see a lot of those as well. And so if that is, you know, sort of at the bottom after the transactional and not the primary purpose, uh, those would not be deemed uh, com uh, commercial purposes uh, for a commercial. So the can spam uh, relates to, we should be talk about the initiator uh, of the message. That's the party who's, who's um, originates or transmits the email. Note that there are sometimes, you know, companies, uh, you can use third parties and that has to do with, you know, who had, may have liability or may, may have a safe harbor. Um, but the, you know, the, um, there are some safe harbors again as well as if you're only a conveyor of the email but essentially i don't think anyone on this call would be a conveyor of an email that would be using a third party uh to send off the message for you and so um, the liability would be with the initiator would be the you know the, the content provider of the of the email so the um you know so in terms of uh, to, in order to uh, send out emails to commercial messages or for commercial messages, you must identify, you know, to obtain consent, you must identify who the sender is and who's going to be sending the message. Um, you must um, state that the, you know, the uh, recipient can, you know, can uh, revoke their consent at any time. You see the unsubscribe uh, sort of at the bottom, for example, uh, of emails. So the um, can spam, so can spam is enforced by the FTC. Um, there's um, uh, the FTC has seek, has sought um, uh, civil penalties for violations of the rules. There's been a number of uh, class actions as well. Uh, state AGs um, and regulatory authorities have the power to enforce uh, violations as well. The injunctive release preventing the ability to send uh, damages or to send emails as well. Uh, there are damages for um, for loss. So when we talk about actual loss, so sometimes you know if these emails, if a lot of a number of emails, Emails go in and overload an email system, for example, uh, prevent someone from getting access to email. Um, the, you know, and all these damages can be troubled uh, based upon, you know, for willful or knowing aggra aggra um, aggravated violations. Um, and then as well as attorney fees, et cetera, and things like that. Uh, internet service providers have also been notorious for bringing claims against the senders of the, or initiators of emails because obviously the impact it has on their um, on their technology and on, on, on their services and has the ability to slow down or prevent or block uh, messages as well. So um, in terms of complying with uh, can spam, there's a number of requirements. So one is you only want to send, you know, you should only be sending uh, messages to people who have affirmatively opted in. You want to keep that list uh, going. You want to, there's a pro, you know, you want to prevent uh, misleading or false information in the transmission of the email. So the, uh, the email must contain a correct from and to and reply to information as well. It must identify the sender of the message and who, you know, and who's and who, who would be receiving it if it's sent out. Um, the, uh, the subject line of the, of the emails uh, must not be deceptive. They must uh, make sure a person is able to determine whether or not this is a commercial message or not via the subject header. So it may, Thus, the, the, the idea is that an individual, um, the, um, the sender of the email or the, sorry, the initiator of the email would have to have, cannot have actual knowledge that the subject heading would be likely to mislead a recipient 
about a fact or a material fact about the message or the content. Uh, again, so you, so if it is a transactional mess or if it is a commercial message, it must be clear to the recipient that it is a clear, that it is a commercial message. Um, you have to include in each email uh, the recipient's right not to receive or opt out of future messages, and you can do that either by one of two means. You can tell them they can simply reply to the message to opt out, or that they can use a uh, some type of internet means such as like clicking on a link uh, that will take them to a web page to opt out. Note that that opt out mechanism um, that where they, if they were going to click to or or if they're going to reply to an email that's going to receive uh, an incoming email for the opt out must be available for at least 30 days after the date the message is, is sent out. Um, the, um, there are some issues about sometimes technical, um, you know, tech, you know, technical reasons why a site may be down and that, that would not be a violation, uh, but note that um, that must be available within 30 days. The other thing is that when you send, if you're going to click on a link, it must take you directly to the opt-out page. You cannot include multiple links. So what you can include is or you can, and the only thing you can request is that whether the link directly implements or in, inputs the recipient's email address or requests them to input their email address. Beyond that, anything else is optional. So you see a lot of things, a lot of uh, email opt-outs that ask you, you know, the reason why, et cetera. All of those are optional and, should, and, and are not required to be um, inputted in order to become effective. Opt-outs for, for, for spam are within 10 business days um, after receipt of the opt-out. <clears throat> Note that an opt-out for can spam does not expire. So until a person opts back in or engages in some type of commercial transaction uh, with, the, with the company, um, there are, you know, the opt-out stays in effect. Um, the commercial messages in, you know, must include the identification that is an advertisement or a solicitation. And you must also include a physical address, a physical, so, so where someone can mail a letter if they wanted to, or serve a company for that purpose. Uh, but usually this is, um, it has to be some type of physical postal address. It can be a PO box uh, <clears throat> uh, as well. So that's, so that's, okay. um, that's permitted. Um, and then um, I'll, I'll uh, talk about, I'll, can, I'll give you a few more examples in just a moment. So um, in terms of marketing consent, so for all, for all types of messages, here are some um, concepts. There's an, an opt-in would, would be a consumer's action to enroll in a program. So consumer takes an affirmative action to enroll in. Um, and usually this is consumers opting in by entering their phone number or an email in a website form and selecting a box and they would receive some type of notifications of some sort. Uh, may also use this, you know, this will also be respond to actions. You may see something advertised somewhere, you know, again, this is the text, uh, you know, something to an ad, you know, to a phone number. Uh, you can get a phone or email that someone could, you know, firmly be opt into versus the opt out, which is, you know, pretty clear is that, you know, when a subscriber says they no longer want to receive a message from you, that's either email or text. For a text message, for example, it's replying stop to the sender. For an email, it's the clicking on subscriber responding. And you're again required to remove all opt-outs from further communication. So a simple sort of checklist um, uh, for, op, you know, for, for text marketing. Um, in the beginning of a program, you want to explain, you know, uh, at, at the moment of opt-in, uh, you, you want to explain, um, provide some information to a user. So in this case would be the uh, business name, uh, the types of messages one can expect, uh, the messaging cadence, you wanna include the standard message and data rates may apply. Uh, you wanna to link to your terms. So these are, um, you need, you know, there are, depending on the nature of the, the program you're running, there's different types of terms that you may need to identify to somebody um, with respect to um, SMS text messaging. So you'll need to link to those as well as a link to your privacy policy, as well as opt out instructions. Now, all of this can be included in that, you know, at the moment, it doesn't have to be in the text uh, message, but at some point uh, when the person's going to sign up. So sometimes you may see an advertisement like a board uh, online or, or, or a little thing online or in, or in a, you know, an advertisement online that's going to include a lot of this information or provide a link to take you to the, the, the terms on the website to allow you to opt in. So prior express written consent um, it is required to do text, uh, is required to text consumers with marketing messages. Uh, this can be done via manually checking a box on a website form I have here. 
Um, also, you could you can verbally agree to opt in, but in that case, must be recorded in the, the recording, as I mentioned earlier, for four years. Um, you can also text a short code to a designated number. That's the advertising. I'll give you an example. Um, and you must also explicitly state that enrolling means that the subscriber is going to agree to receive text messages from you. Uh, to confirm an opt-in, so we have this double opt-in, which the, you know, so the TCPA requires texting recipients a disclosure message confirming that they're participating in an SMS program. Uh, this would be different if it's a one-time text message, but if you're talking about any type of recurring text messaging, you have to con the user has to confirm that they're actually um, engaging in one of these uh, text messaging programs. And then the, the, the message is going to reiterate the details of the program um, at opt-in. And then again, you'll want to communicate those terms and conditions. And again, you're going to want to provide those links to those terms. Um, and so, it, you know, additional, a few additional options or a few additional things. So timing, um, as I said, you cannot call or text before 8 a.m. or after 9 p.m. local time with the exception of uh, Washington, which I mentioned was 8 p.m. Uh, you need to identify the company in every message. You need to provide an easy opt out, whether that's in the email or the text message, you must respond to the stop command. Uh, you want to avoid shaft and shaft is essentially an acronym for sex, uh, alcohol, firearms and tobacco. Um, and then and also, I guess, uh, hate speech as well. Um, um, I'm sorry, I should say that. I, I didn't miss that. Sorry. Sex, hate, alcohol, firearms and tobacco. I knew there <laughs> I was one letter off. And then um, don't message opt outs. You know, again, messaging opt outs has been a, um, one of the many particular areas of heated litigation. So here are some um, opt in examples. Um, the, the, uh, the, the one, um, so in this first one, for example, this is if someone wants to opt in, so this is via text message. I made up this vacay time. So this would be the opt-in or so if you, you know, vacay time is some company. And so if you want to receive special deals to your mobile phone, you're going to text the, you know, the short code, uh, you're going to text vacay to one, two, three, four, five, six. Could be one two three four five. I think you know whatever. I think that's one two three four five. But you would respond. You know, then you would receive a text message um, from VK. You know, and this would be the, the message to verify your enrollment. You'll need to confirm by by reply text. In this case, you'll receive up to two automated messages a week. You're seeing. You know, you're getting the, the cadence. Uh, consent's not required for purchase because these are commercial messages. Um, and then you would stop for stop help for help message of data rate supply. Um, all and so then the consumer would reply in this case uh, to get the opt in, and then in response to that, you would say you would reply yes to confirm receipt of a promotional automated text messaging from vacay time to this mobile number. You receive again repeating again the same the the, 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 the program up to two mess automated messages a week. Consent not required to purchase. Stop to stop. Help for help. Example. Uh, another type of opt in. Uh, this could be either uh, this would be on like on a website, for example, or on an email. Uh, so by clicking yes, or if it's on an email, replying to the email, consent to receive phone calls from the K time regarding the K times properties at the phone number listed above, including my wireless number of provided. So this way, if someone gives you the wireless number and you text them, they have their consent. And I understand these calls may be generated using an automated technology and that my consent is not required to make a purchase. So again, you're, you're um, including all the requirements in here. And then you are, um, uh, as well as getting consent for automated technology as well. A pause here. I understand that there's the CLE code. Is that correct? Yes. Let me get that slide up real quick. I think we're, yep. At That's... this time, I will announce the first CLE code. For those seeking CLE credit today, please type the following five digit code in the polling box on your screen and record it on your attorney affirmation form if applicable, which can be found in the resources tab on your screen. The first code is T as in Tom, N as in November, E as in Echo, N as in November, W as in William. Again, that's T as in Tom, N as in November, E as in Echo, N as in November, and W as in William. Please record this code in the appropriate places, and I will turn it back over to Aaron. All right. Well, I thank you. And so we're... All right. 
I, I think I'm back. Somehow I got disconnected from that. But back to me. All right. I'm assuming everyone can. I'm assuming I'm back. Uh, so we are. I'm going to do a, a brief overview of privacy laws. And I think one thing that I want to bring up the reason why I want to connect this into this presentation as well is that there's actually, interestingly enough, um, the, you know, in with respect to things like CCPA, and we're going to see in other privacy laws as well that are coming up, there is a direct connection to uh, consume to, I'm not sure what the slides are doing, but to, okay, but to, um, uh, to, uh, sorry, telecommunications, uh, you know, text and, and sort of marketing. So under CCPA, for example, a business must create a process uh, for customers to submit direct, you know, data access requests, uh, at, you know, as well as uh, the state of privacy policy, how those information is being used, uh, must process opt-in requests and consent uh, for, you know, and, and, for, and then uh, avoid, pro and then avoid any type of opt-in for an in individual who opts out uh, for a texting program. So these overlap uh, with marketing programs. So CCPA, uh, CPR, which is coming to effect a number of other state laws will have an impact. Uh, will have additional obligations and limitations on the ability to, or restrictions, I should say, on the ability to use uh, text and calls for marketing purposes. Uh, so essentially there are, um, there's a number of um, um, uh, privacy laws that have come into effect. Uh, the only one that is that has a fully comprehensive privacy law that's currently in effect uh, is California, the CCPA. Um, although four states, four states are coming into effect, we got first of all we also have California, the California Privacy Rights Act, the CPRA, which will be effective January 1st of 2023, uh, will be fully enforceable on on July 1st of 2023. But it has a look back period all the way back to January 1st of 2022, meaning. Uh, that there are obligations, you know, that you, there could be liability for things engaged in today, uh, potentially underneath the CPRA. Uh, Cal Colorado's goes into effect on July, for, uh, July 1st of 2023, although they may adopt some additional rules um, before January 1st of 2025, they'll become effective on July 1st, 2025. Uh, Virginia's Consumer Data Protection Act, and Protect Act will go uh, into effect on January 1st, 2023. And Connecticut will go into effect on January 1st as well. I've got some highlights of all of these in a moment, so we're not going to run through them all at the moment. Uh, but there's, um, in terms of states considering privacy statutes, currently uh, 21 states right now have introduced some sort of privacy legislation. Um, and then uh, and others have, renewed, have some other renewed efforts. Uh, there are more on the books, and we're seeing that even since um, I pulled this slide on, this was you know, on, on June 9th, the, this image that there are a few more that are, uh, have been announced as well. So we're seeing, you know, it's very active in terms of what's going on in privacy at the moment. Um, but some common principles that seem to apply across all of the privacy laws that are either in effect now or that will come into effect uh, essentially are the scope and applicability and, and exemptions across the board. Uh, they all have some, some type of individual rights uh, most of them pretty much access, rectification, uh, deletion, restriction, portability, and opt-out. Uh, so similar, as people will say, similar, similar in effect somewhat to GDPR, similar to those who are already familiar with CCPA. Um, they all have notice and transparency requirements. Uh, they all pretty much require some type of legal basis for processing, meaning that you need to have a stated reason as to why you have the ability uh, to process that information and, and, uh, in order for you to process that personal information of an individual. Um, there are going to be uh, different versions of processing principles in terms of some types of uh, limitations on the purposes of why you can process data, as well as data minimizations. They all have, or almost all will have, or have, or do have requirements uh, in terms of seeing a lot of this being new uh, requirements for contract, you know, for uh, contracting with subcontractors and vendors and third parties. So requiring that all your contractors have. Um, uh, certain minimum requirements in their contracts, as well as, you know, doing some type of, depending on what law we're talking about, some type of privacy or security assessment of the vendor. Uh, and then again, ensuring via con contractual restrictions on their ability to process data and, and share, et cetera, disclose it. I'll, um, breach, you know, that all of them are, include additional updates to data breach notification obligations, as well as these privacy laws uh, do include security obligations as well. Uh, they all recruit. Uh, they all include uh, record keeping or logs keeping. You know, keep, um, keeping um, 
uh, keeping records of the nature of the processing and being able to produce that if requested by an individual or by a regulator. Um, they all require some type of risk and impact assessment. So conducting a, an assessment of the company in terms of, you know, determining which or how to apply those requirements to the organization to ensure that uh, the risk is, uh, is minimized. And then um, there's also international data transfer restrictions about transferring data uh, across borders. Um, so in terms of understanding how to build, you know, uh, and we're, you're going to see in just a moment, um, all these laws sort of laid out in a, in a little bit easier framework again, which is why we're not going um, in them in depth at just a moment. Um, but they all require, in order to comply essentially across the board, there's a couple of commonalities that will make it easier to do so. One is to do a uh, data mapping exercise to understand the data that you have within the organization uh, and use that to then perform a risk assessment once you understand the nature and sensitivity of the data you have and how it's being used. Uh, to, you know, determine any type of legal and program requirements um, that you may have obligations that you may have, and then it's developing or updating internal controls and policies, uh, ensuring your vendor compliance, um, and then implementing some type of privacy compliance framework, and there's a number of those available. And so what I'm, I, I laid this out fairly easily. I also included GDPR since everybody asked about that. So this is a fairly, um, this is sort of a, a takeaway, take home um, in terms of the uh, sort of a detailed review of um, of the major US privacy laws, as well as with GDPR. There's a couple of slides on this um, that tells you sort of the differences and things for you to understand and be aware of. I thought this would be a helpful tool uh, or a helpful reference for you to, to have in your file. And so finally, just closing off, just uh, because everybody asks as well, just understanding you know, just a little bit of um, cybersecurity, understanding sort of the threat landscape, and just uh, want to give you just a little bit of update. So the average cost of a breach, right? You know, the latest sort of data shows it's it, our company is going to spend nine, just over nine million dollars. Uh, has continued to increase, you know, by, by magnitudes you know, over the last number of years. Um, the you know the cost of a breach, you know, includes you know detection, escalate. You know, there's a number of factors in here: lost business records, response, notification, loss of business. Um, the risk occurs from all over the place. You know, there's certainly um, everything from the malicious third actor, you know, whether a malicious insider or a threat actor, uh, some type of technical error with, a, with the system, some type of glitch, some type of, um, uh, of, um, of, um, uh, of error, et cetera. And then also human error that, you know, somebody responds, for example, to a, to gets fished or, or gives the credentials away or doesn't realize and sends out a whole file to somebody of data. Um, the costs certainly vary. Now, the upside, on one hand, as you can see, the hospitality industry pretty much at the bottom of the list in terms of, you know, in terms of the cost by industry. But, you know, you still see, you know, if you think about it, if you see that, you know, you, you know, it almost doubled from last, you know, from 2020 to 2021 in terms of the average cost uh, per record. And then you multiply, you think about this, you know, certainly by the number of records. And it's still, even though it's down there near the bottom, um, it's still, they still get fairly expensive. Um, this is, you know, a chart I use uh, quite a bit. It's been, you know, whenever we're, I'm reviewing and looking at um, incident response programs and companies looking at their um, cybersecurity, um, information security programs, et cetera, I look at sort of this to see, you know, what are the things we can do to get the sort of the best return on investment to, you know, to decrease the cost um, of a plan or of an incident. So if you look at the top, everything, I'm not, you know, the colors are, have gotten interesting. Uh, but everything on the top in the green going to the left on this, you know, things that you can do to decrease the cost of an incident. These are, you know, these are a return on investment and things at the bottom are things that will obviously increase the cost. Um, so some of the best things we do, we spend a lot of time dealing with building out those incident response plans and testing them, uh, helping build, you know, helping companies become, you know, a little bit more cyber resistant, uh, building, you know, their information security platforms, um, do a lot of testing, you know, use of encryption, training. These are all things. Uh, that are valuable. Um, you know, now the only interesting one is insurance protection. Now this has got an interesting one because this cuts both ways is that we're seeing a lot of insurance companies sort of flipping around and sort of decreasing coverage, change, you know, causing the premium to go up quite a bit. Uh, but we're, we're seeing that, but we're also seeing a lot of insurance companies are demanding that if they're going to continue to insure, uh, they're putting their own um, obligations in place to ensure that companies comply and doing their own testing and vulnerability testing, et cetera. Um, and then obviously things, you know, companies that, you know, lost stolen devices, you know, um, 
I talk about extensive cloud migration and people always ask me about that. So during the time of moving from, you know, a on-prem to a cloud, this is the migration element. This is not being fully in the cloud. Um, you know, if you're talking about being on this, you know, on, on a number, there's a number of secure platforms uh, that you can be on that that would decrease the cost, but it is, this is the migration process of moving over. And then to close out, um, obviously a number of uh, uh, places where there can be liability uh, for, um, for cybersecurity issues, including you know everything from you know lawsuits, uh, enforcement actions, class actions, contractual liability that you may owe to another party, uh, given the cost, you know, given you know, given the implications, uh, certainly reputational costs, um, lost profits, et cetera, ransom payments, and so these are all things that create the um, uh, create liability. So, for that, um, I know I'm gonna. So that's the end of of my. I think that's the end of my presentation. Oh, no, that's I, 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 as for a ransom work and came after. So we've got a couple of questions. I will answer those. We'll get those at the end of the program today. I want to just close up the last few the ransomware since I know I've had a couple of people have asked me that as well. Uh, so just ransomware has gone up, uh, has increased significantly. In the last year, we've seen average payments going up. Um, you know, ransomware, um, in addition, to you know, for you know, in addition to the number of hours, you know, or the amount of time it takes for a for an organization to sort of respond to when hit with uh, a ransomware uh, matter, the if you put all the factors together, the remediation process once you once you theoretically are able to start to recover, uh, it's another two million dollars in just cost beyond the ransomware payment in terms of you know internal costs and external costs in terms of recovery. Um, the, uh, those costs include a number of factors. So there's, um, you know, there's downtime, uh, current, some cost, you know, there are some customers that uh, tend to leave, uh, you know, they get negative, um, you get negative brand, you get, you get negative PR after it. There's the cost of mailing notification letters, the cost of providing um, um, uh, uh, credit monitoring if that's applicable. There's cost to, to lawyers, there's cost, you know, in terms of litigation. Um, there's, you know, there's additional costs that will have to be implemented in terms of IT costs, both the recovery, the remediation, as well as potential, uh, you know, expenditure on, on new systems or new uh, processes or, or services. Um, there's going to be additional costs for, you know, bringing forensics and vendors, um, you know, and, and conducting additional security tests, uh, ultimately to determine that the environment has been cleaned and moving on as well as potential regulatory fines. Um, so the, you know, there's, there's, um, a number, you know, there's guidance in terms of whether or not to pay. There's certainly guidance that comes out of the White House that currently comes out of OFAC in terms of who can pay and, and what you can pay. Um, there's limitations on, on when you can pay and when you can't pay, certainly for ransom. You certainly don't want to make it, we want to make sure we don't make any payments to anyone who's on a sanction list or designated or blocked persons list. So we always look at those types of things. And some of those things sort of just put the, um, uh, put limitations on what a company can do in terms of response to um, in, in, in terms of response to a live or response to a ransom payment. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll stop there in terms of questions. I know there's a few here. Um, and so I will, um, given the time, we'll answer these at the end of the presentation today.